21 days of prayer and fasting. Let me just ask you for a moment and just be honest. How many have done an extended fast like that ever before? Maybe half of us. That's better than first service. Hardly any first service had. And the rest of us, how many have, have never, just be honest, how many have never fasted at all? Okay. This is a few. Okay. That's all right. That's okay. It's just not something that is commonly talked about or talked about, taught in our churches. The Bible really is full of fasting. I'm going to look at some of those examples today. We certainly can't exhaust the examples in one service. Uh, but I encourage you to do a little search and study on your own. But I want to share some scriptures, and we want to talk about what fasting is. I'm going to give us some biblical examples. I'm going to give us some practical advice. I would encourage you, if you've never fasted for a long period of time, that you get on our website, right on the front page, you'll see Fast 2019. You can click there. It'll take you through some ideas, different things. Some of those I'll cover this morning, but there's a lot more detailed information that will help you in your fast. If you consider Resurrection Life Church your church, or if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, for that matter, it is a good discipline to follow him and to fast. And we love the beginning of the year because, listen, the way you start the beginning of your year, the way you set your mind is the way that year will go. And I'm believing for this year that it is my best year ever. How many want to believe that with me? Say, it's my best year? Say, ever. See, if you believe that and you focus on Jesus, not only in these 21 days, but throughout the course of the year, if you make him the primary goal in your life is to draw close to him, your year is going to turn out just fantastic. Because if you are healthy and mindful of the Lord spiritually, the rest of your life will follow naturally. And so we really need to make him a focus, and that's what we want to talk about this morning. Let's pray. Father, I ask in the next few moments that you would speak to our hearts. Uh, tell us the fast that you don't want and the fast that you approve of so that when we fast over these 21 days that we truly are surrendering to you, that we're humbling ourselves, and we know that you will teach us and satisfy us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's read this together in Matthew chapter 6. It says, but when you pray, go into your room and when you shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I love Matthew chapter 6, and it's no coincidence, I don't think, if you follow the Bible reading plan that we hand out here on a regular basis. If you want one, you can get one. We've got them over on the information table, but Trish and I have been reading them for years, and that's how I start every day as I go through that and read a little bit and then read a little bit more, and then, of course, this morning I would go over my notes one last time and make sure that I'm prepared to bring the message for all of you here today. But I started out, and, I, and if you read that this morning, you saw we read Matthew 6, so I think God's got our attention there. I had no idea when I prepared this message. I had no idea even when I really felt that we were supposed to start our fast today rather than last Sunday. And then I opened it up this morning. I'm like, okay, God, you know better. But Jesus didn't say if you pray. He said when. Somebody say when. All right. And I heard someone say this, and I believe it. More people believe in prayer than actually pray. And so prayer is a discipline that the Bible is full of. What's prayer? It's communicating with God, just openly, honestly, having communication with God, and then taking it a step further as we meditate on his promises, then we start to speak those into our life and ask God to show us the areas we need to change. That's, in a nutshell, what prayer is, just living with God, talking with him. It's just like that old song, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. You know, some little kid said, I know God's first name, Andy, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. And he tells me, okay, that's a joke. For those of you that aren't going aren't gonna to laugh no matter what I say. Look at verse 16. He says, moreover, that means even more so. So even more than praying, listen to what Jesus is saying. When you fast, not if you fast, when you fast. So even above prayer, and let me just say this, fasting is a prayer. If all you do is fast and never utter a word, but truly submit yourself to God in fasting, it's a prayer. And so Jesus says, moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites who have a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. And surely I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face. You can wear some perfume. You can wear some cologne, shave. All right. So what you do to appear to men to be fasting, but to your fa you're not appearing to men to be fasting, but your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys or where thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
And you read all of Matthew 6, and Jesus goes on and he starts to talk about the cares of this world that literally strip us from our relationship with God. Uh, clothes and food and money and all these things. And in fact, I'm going to start a series some, probably sometime in February. Uh, if you go on the website, it says coming soon, and it's just titled Money. Uh, because Jesus talked in this very chapter about money and how we handle it. So he's talking about prayer, he's talking about fa finance, uh, um, uh, fasting, and he's also talking about focusing on heaven where our treasure is. And so these are important, important things to us. But he says, don't, don't make a big deal out of it before man. And I'm, I'm not trying to insult anyone, but I am going to uh, sacrifice a few religious cows this morning. Um, don't, you know, and there, there were times in the Bible, and I know you could show me examples, but I'm going to take Jesus' example here on fasting, and there's also an Old Testament example that really shows us the kind of fast that God's pleased with. We'll look at that in just a moment. But there are examples in the Bible where they would put ashes on their head and they would mope around. Jesus is saying, don't, don't fast like that. So tomorrow, don't go in unshaved, barely got out of bed because you were so hungry, and you go into the office and they have donuts there, and you go, oh, I can't. Who brought these donuts in? I can't eat them. I'm fasting before the Lord. No, you're not. You're fasting to be seen by men. And, and, and now I'm not saying you can't talk to anybody. If, if someone says, hey, can we hook up for lunch? Say, you know, I'd love to hook up, but right now I'm doing a specific, specific fast to draw near to the Lord. You can tell people that. But don't make something out of it that it's not. Okay? We're not trying to show people how holy we are. A fast is not to one-up one another. I, I tease Trish all the time so I, when she says, well, this is what I'm going to do for the fast. I say, you're just trying to one-up everybody, aren't you? Now, it's okay to have some fun with, you know, your husband or your wife. But listen, we're not trying to one-up one another. We need to choose a fast that works for us. But the key is that we're praying, that we're fasting, that we're focusing on God. And let me just say this. I'll go through some more practical stuff in a moment. Fasting certainly would include uh, laying down entertainment, laying down your cell phone, getting off Facebook for a period of time, and Instagram, and chat box or whatever's out. There's so many things out there. What's the latest one? Um, Instagram is real popular. What's it called? Snapchat, that's it. Chat box, snap box, whatever it is, you know. I don't have that one, you can tell. I'm, I have Facebook, but I'm not on it very much. So, I mean, if you want to contact me there, you can, and I will get back with you. That's one of the reasons I keep it, in case people want to get a hold of me and don't have any contact information. But, but setting that stuff aside, but listen, food needs to be part of your fast. In fact, it needs to be a very large part of your fast. A bi biblical fasting is laying down food for a period of time. Going without food. And so about half of us have done that. The other half haven't. Um, if you haven't done it, start slow. All right? You're fasting before the Lord to humble yourself, to draw near to him. You're not twisting God's arm. So don't think, well, I'm going to fast, and then I'm going to get the answer to my prayer in 21 days. That is not what fasting is. You cannot twist. God's arm is too big for you to twist. How many agree with that? You cannot twist God's arm. What we're doing is we're drawing. We're try what did you say? We're trying? Oh, yeah, you can't. Yeah, you've tried. It doesn't work. But um, so what we're doing is we're drawing near to God because we, what we're really saying is, Lord, I realize that in my life I've allowed things to creep in that are keeping me away from your presence. Therefore, I am laying down food for a period of time as well as other things so you can show me the areas that are keeping me from my relationship with you that I can grow deeper. And when you show me those things, I'm going to remove them for good so that I can hear you throughout the year. If you just fast 21 days here with us and never fast again the rest of the year, you miss the point. I mean, if you, if you sincerely fast one day a week for three weeks, take a whole day or a meal or a series of days, whatever it is God puts on your heart, if you take that and say, okay, Lord, teach me a discipline that I can carry throughout the year. Many of us in this church fast one or several days every week, all throughout the year, and I would encourage you to do that. Say, well, how can I do that? You can do it. You can do it. Uh, Jesus didn't say if you fast. Now, I understand if you're under uh, instructions from a doctor or something, please check with your doctor, your physician. I, I understand there may be some cases there. But Jesus didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. So fasting should be something. What we're doing is we're teaching ourselves a discipline that when things are rough, my immediate reaction is to fast. When things aren't going right, when I see that there's way too much of my ugly self in my life, come on, somebody, then I know, look, ooh, I'm nasty, I'm going to fast. And so we learn how to fast. What we're doing is we're humbling ourselves, getting ourselves out of the way. We're not twisting God's arm. How many know God doesn't change? Jesus Christ, uh, today, yesterday, the, the, forever, he's always the same. I am God. I do not change, it says in Malachi chapter 3. 
So God doesn't change, but we do. So we're committing to, to make a time to pray, not only this 21 days, throughout uh, the year. And, and let me just tell you this, that there will be physical benefits, health benefits to uh, fasting, but there's spiritual benefits that far outweigh those. But really, it is just good naturally to fast. So it's great spiritually. It's also good naturally. It is a good discipline. It cleanses your body of toxins, as, uh, spiritual toxins as well as natural toxins. So let me just, for those who have never fasted, let me tell you a little bit what to expect. If you drink coffee on a regular basis or if you drink sweetened sodas or drinks on a regular basis or a lot of processed foods, um, I, I would almost guarantee you, and don't just take my word for it, you pray about it, almost guarantee you that God would call you to lay some of that down. Maybe all of it, I don't know. Uh, one at a time. You can go slow. But if you start to lay down processed foods, sugary drinks, coffee perhaps, again, I'm not telling you what to do. Please understand what I'm saying. If you start to do that, you're going to get a headache. Your body is detoxifying. Most of the food, food that, our, that we eat on a regular basis, okay, is full of toxins. It is not good for us. All right? Most of us, our diets are not really that healthy, and that's just, that's just the truth. And so God, one thing, he could help us to have healthier diets. I know some people say, well, I'm going to eat, just learn how to eat better on this, this fast. And that's good to do that, but you should also go without some food for part of that fast, all right, and part of that 21 days. And then you should ask God to help you to eat that way for the rest of your life. Amen. Don't go back to the junk food. I, I'm serious. And you say, well, pastor, are you against junk food? No. I eat junk food once in a while, but listen, here's the case. And I used to eat chips and Doritos and m and I mean, literally M&Ms by the handful. I'm not kidding you. And, 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 and really, God got a hold of my heart, I don't know, probably 20 years ago or so. And, and uh, we'd been Christians for six, eight years, whatever it was, and, and got a hold of our, our heart with fasting and with eating differently. And, and I realized how much different you feel. And if you've ever done that, you know that I'm telling you the truth. But that's just a natural aspect. Spiritually, what you're doing, it's basically this garbage in, garbage out. What we're doing on this fast, we're saying, okay, God, what food am I eating that I'm relying on more to wake me up, to get me through the day, to satisfy me? What am I relying on more than you? And occasionally, you know, even though I've given up junk food, I mean, I really don't eat junk food. I will have a Dorito or two, but I'm not kidding you. Rather than a bag... I'm, I'm thinking days when I was 19, 20 years old, I would literally buy a family-sized Dorito bag. That was back when they were like two bucks. They're like seven bucks or something now. But thank God I don't buy them. But, they're, they're, you know, we'll get them. Maybe I'm at a special party. and it's just, Oh, Doritos sound good. And literally, I'll eat two or three. That's all I can handle. I'm, I'm not kidding you. Went from a bag to two or three. And if I'm stepping on somebody's toes, good. Um, because I, I do think that there's some things God wants to teach us because our natural, things you do in the natural affect you spiritually. I've got way too many pages of notes today, and sometime over the next couple of weeks, I want to go through uh, just a few values that I think God has given us as a congregation, but they're natural disciplines. Natural disciplines benefit us spiritually. It's just the truth. Uh, the Bible says that our flesh or the carnal man is at enmity with God, which means butting heads, but it doesn't have to be that way. God made a spirit, soul, and body. We're three parts. We are a spirit. We have a soul, our mind, will, and emotions, and we live in a body. Somebody say, darn it. Yeah, it's, it's the body that gives us most of the problems. And so fasting, we're laying down the body so that the mind can now focus on what the spirit is saying, and then the body will follow. Does that make sense? That's really what fasting is. It is a great discipline. That's why Jesus told us to do it. So we're doing an inventory. What am I reading? What am I listening to? What am I watching? What am I eating? Um, I, 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 and more and more, I'll tell you, I, I cannot even handle TV. And if I'm, again, if, I, if I'm pressuring you, good, I guess. I, I don't, but, but I do think some of the things, and I watch a little TV. I'm not against entertainment. I think entertainment is great. But we have so much stuff. It's, I see the commercials when I do choose to watch something on TV. The commercials, I'm like, are people really watching this stuff? And I hope not. I don't know, but somebody must be because they keep producing it. And, and you say, well, it's really not that bad, Pastor. There's no sex and there's no violence in it. Yeah, but it's stupid. Yeah. And, and you say, well, what's wrong with stupid? Well, the Bible says we shouldn't be stupid, first of all. We shouldn't be foolish. Now, it's okay to have fun. There's nothing wrong with comedy. Nothing wrong with a comedian. That's all good stuff. But how much do we need? We get to a point, you know, I have a friend of mine, Dr. Don Verhulst. He calls the TV uh, the income reducer. Because we do is we all work or whatever we do, and we get home and plop down in front of that thing. Say, but I'm watching all good stuff. Listen, that may very well be, 
but you can watch all kinds of good stuff. I believe so many people know something about Jesus, have met him, but really don't know him. See, people can help you to meet Jesus, help you to realize what he's like. For instance, I can introduce you to Jesus this morning, and that is my prayer. But you need to get to know him on your own. And that's not something we can do through TV. TV will help us if you're watching a good program, but it needs to be turned off at some point. Does this make sense? Is this okay with you? Okay. And so what fasting is doing is saying, okay, where are these areas? Because we have so many things. In fact, everything, clothes, food, houses, lands, money, all these things take precedence over the Lord. And, and can we just be honest? Every one of us could say at times throughout the course of a year, there's many other things in our lives that are more important than God. Can we be honest in this place? I, I'm raising both my hands. There's times I'm like, oh, my gosh, Lord, how did I let this get in? But we just fall into patterns. And so what fasting does is it breaks that pattern. And that's why we need to do it throughout the course of a year. So, we're, again, we're choosing 21 days. The reason is to establish a habit or a lifestyle. This is a good habit. You need a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, buy one. If you can't afford one, let us know, and we'll get one for you. Seriously, you talk to Pastor Bob. So the Bible you need, I recommend, get, if you don't have a paper Bible, buy one. Get that, put that phone down for 21 days. Put that iPad down for 21 days. I'm not saying you can't use the phone, you can't use the iPad, but do something that, that causes you to kind of just break up your fallow ground. Causes you to break up a habit that maybe we've fallen into that has kept us from hearing the voice of God clearly. Listen, hearing God clearly, is, it's hard. It's not easy. Can we hear his voice? Absolutely. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So yes, we can when we're in tune to it. But we need to tune into it from time to time because our flesh just wanders. Okay? So we're choosing 21. You know, Bible, a reading plan, a journal or something to write on. We're going to hand out uh, 21 days prayer fasting journals. When you leave, get one. Get, get a couple. I don't care. Get, we have plenty of them. But get one. And we're just, basically, it's just a scripture a day. It starts today with Matthew 6. There's a few ch- uh, verses in there. It's a simple prayer that we can pray together. And it's a place you can write down some notes. If you want a journal beyond that, certainly you're, you can do that. But we want something that we can be just praying. Something happens when a church chooses to pray, specifically seek God for themselves, for the church, for their friends, for their family. Something happens. The environment changes. I'm going to tell you, over the next three weeks, we're going to see service is you're going to be like, oh, man, this is awesome. But what happens is then some of those, listen, listen, some of those services will kind of, they'll be, listen, I think all our services are awesome, by the way, when we gather together because we got, we got the greatest people that love Jesus in all the world. But there are, are services that, that it seems like God moves in a more powerful way. I'm going to tell you why, fasting. So many times we come to church and we're not ready to really seek God together. What if we were a church that said, I'm going to fast throughout the week and I'm going to ask God to use me throughout the week in my interactive personal life, but then when I get to church, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to expect God to move to give me something, to bless someone that comes, and I'm going to step out and I'm going to invite someone to come to church because God is using me in a powerful way. If we all started to think that way and realize how important God was and started to lay things down in our lives, and and that's what fasting does. It helps us to focus on God and to put him first. You need time to read. You need time to meditate. And let me just say this. Read daily. Grab a, 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 if you don't have a Bible reading program, we've got those, as I mentioned, on the Information Center. It will help you follow a structured plan. I mean, and we'll say, well, I just like to read it as it flops open. That's okay. But listen, a disciplined way to read, it causes you, just, I've been, years, I'm not kidding you, at least 15 years I've used the same Bible program. It's the same one we've got. Takes me through the Bible in one year. Say, well, pastor, I could read it quicker than that. You probably could, but how much would you retain? In fact, and this may sound elementary, but I'm just going to say it to help some of us that need the help. Most, if not all Bibles, I believe, have center column references, side column references, or lower column references where you have numbers or letters that take you to another verse highlighted in a particular series of verses that you're reading. How many have seen that? What you do is you take that verse, you meditate, then you go to the other verses. What you're starting to do is you're starting to see a pattern in the Bible, and those who author this and put it together find patterns in the Bible where you can see where God's personality, what he said was consistent. So now you can start to say, okay, well, if God did this two or three times, then he's doing it for me. That's meditating on the word of God and saying, okay, God, by his stripes I am healed. By his stripes I am healed. Jesus took stripes for my healing. Jesus bore stripes upon his back for my healing. 
It says that God took pleasure in bruising Jesus for my health. And you start to look at it from different angles and start to say, no, I, this sickness has to go. He has met all my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. All right? And, and we just start to meditate and look at other places where God provided. God is a provider, and he's good at it. But again, read daily, read prayerfully, ask the Spirit for help, read with expectation. Okay, different types of fasts. I've talked a little bit. Uh, specific food or activity, I think we should lay down. And don't just say, I'm not going to be on Facebook for 21 days. See you all. And then get it in the middle of the night. You're on there anyway. Say, so hope nobody, because I think on there, people, people can see if you're on there. You know that. I think, I think it's something on there. Nobody going to see me. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, and somebody's on there. Hi, how you doing? I thought you were going to be off Facebook. Well, yeah. But, but you, don't just, I mean, get off it. If, you're gonna, and I'm not, if you don't want to, don't. Maybe it's not a problem for you. I, that's fine. I'm not telling you what to do, but, but don't just post something out there. Well, I'm on fast. You won't see me for 21 days. There, my fast is done. No, that, all you did was put out some kind of commercial that you're holier than everybody else. That's all you did. I mean, really, fa it's a fast to the Lord, a fast to the Lord. I'm going to be hungry for the Lord. I am going to lay down food for a period of time for the Lord. All right? I was talking to uh, my friend Josh Martin. Where are you at, Josh? I see Tasha. He's probably out in the hall. I know he's ushering today. I know you're out there. You may not be able to hear me. They're trying to fix that speaker out there. I know, but I was talking to Josh, and la he said last year, I think it was, or if it wasn't last year, it was the first time he fasted for an extended period of time, and he went for three days without food, just drank water. And he said, yeah, there was sometimes I just had to pray because, man, I started getting dizzy and all this stuff. And, and, and I understand, listen, and most of that is caused by whatever your diet is. That's just the truth. Um, and you say, well, you know, I, I work hard and heavy all, all day long. God knows that. The people God wrote the Bible to and for us to read now, God knows that we all work. Can, do you know that? Okay, don't, don't use your work as an excuse to not fast. You can do this. Say, well, but I need my energy throughout the day. Okay, try this. Eat breakfast, eat a healthy lunch, and then don't eat the rest of the day. When you get home, turn off the TV, don't eat dinner, and dedicate yourself to Bible reading. Say, well, pastor, I wouldn't be able to sleep. You'll be able to sleep just fine. You'll be able to sleep just fine. Now, let me say this with that. There will be some times on an extended fast where you may experience some sleep, sleeplessness. Not the whole fast, but you might. You, you are changing your life up. But what do you do? You, you pray. Say, but pastor, I won't get enough sleep. Okay, it's only a day or two. Listen, you, get, you lose your sleep worrying all night anyway. I mean, what? does this make sense? Okay, we, you got to believe that God is a God of favor. you got to believe that when God has your attention, he wants to say something good to you. Yeah. I had this whole paradigm shift thinking just over the past couple of days, and it, it might turn into a series, so this may be coming in a couple of months. I don't know. But here's the thing. I started thinking about favor, and I think the favor of God, and, you know, we got people that preach the name it and claim it and the prosperity gospel, and that's, that's just a bunch of hogwash. Can I just say that? Does God prosper? Absolutely. Does God want us to have a lot of money? As much as we can handle. As much as we manage well, he'll give us more. Not everybody's supposed to be a millionaire. I, I don't believe that. Uh, people who have millions and don't give it away, what did that benefit? But if they give it away and it helps other people, then God needs other people that aren't making those millions to manage whatever those millions go into to reach other people. So it, it all kind of works together. So God wants to bless us, but I started thinking, man, there's so much suffering and there's pain and there's disease and, and there's heartache and there's all these things. That, how many know life has disappointments? Has anyone found that out? And I felt like the Spirit of God is just saying, well, what if it was my favor that allowed these disappointments in your life. I thought, what is, what is that supposed to mean? And he said, well, it's my favor because when things happen, which are going to happen, Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. That's what he said. Not you might. He said, you will. Just like he said, when you fast, you, he said, you will have trouble. He said, and, and I believe the Spirit of God said to me, well, it's my favor because when those hard things come and you choose to drive yourself to me, you get in a deeper relationship with me. And so it's through those, what am I doing in my challenge? What am I doing in my trial? Am I complaining or am I saying, God, your favor is upon me, therefore I'm going to take this opportunity to pray and start to confess your word over my life. And in the process, you get to know him better than you've ever known him before in your life. What, what if that was just part of God's divine favor? You say, well, pastor, that just sounds like an excuse for not getting your prayers answered. I disagree completely. 
We think, well, things have to happen fast and things have to happen big and things have to do this way and that way or God wasn't in it. How, how, since when did we figure God out? I'm telling you, you can't figure God out. It's a lifelong process and then you're still going to come short. It says he'll wipe the tears away in heaven. I think some of that's going to be like, I can't believe I was that wrong. Everybody smile at me. Uh, I know we're all pretty holy in this place. I know that. But God's fit me to say favor. If we take the experiences in life and drive it to a deeper relationship with God, that's his favor all over. And what we're doing in fasting is we're causing ourselves to suffer and choose God first. So we're driving ourselves so that when we do suffer, heartache, loss, pain, things in life, our automatic response now is God. Not griping, not complaining, not staying in the wilderness. Does this all, is this all kind of making sense to you today? And this is what fasting is. Fasting is not twisting God's arm. You're not going to get a magic. This is not, I love these things, you know, I see on, 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 on social media. Forward this message to 21 of your best friends and your prayers will all be answered. They're like, no, they won't. Jesus did not say that. Say, well, it's just fun, Pastor. Yeah, but it's wrong and it, it's not true. It's just not, it's, it's not good doctrine and Christians shouldn't post that stuff. Non-Christians, okay, they don't know any better. Everybody smile at me. All right. But that didn't work. Like, God is not a genie in a bottle. You realize that, don't you? A genie in a bottle comes up and, how many wishes may I grant you, Master? God is not your servant. Now, Jesus, being the absolute representation of God, did serve, without a doubt. But he is not your servant. He's not your personal servant. You rub your bottle. Say, 21 days, Jesus. Seven come 11. Shoot. Okay, now, you might have been at the casino last night, but God wasn't. All right. Okay, I know I'm going too far now. <laughs> All right. Specific types of fasts. Food, maybe a juice fast. Say, can I go 21 days on juice? A lot of people do. And again, if you've never done it, start slow. Um, again, Tr Trish and I, we do this regularly. We have for a number of years. And so we started preparing last week. And I know there's some people that already did, so those who know, who fasted 21 days and do a pretty strict fast. you got to prepare, <laughs> okay? Um, and so, again, our point is not only to be fasting and praying together, but teaching you how to discipline yourself and do it yourself. And so what if you did this? If you haven't prepared, and most of us probably haven't, some have, but if you haven't prepared, why don't you take the first week starting to remove little things, then the second week you can have your hard fast, whatever that is, and then the third week, you can just kind of extend that and start to prepare to break it. And when you break it, break it slow. Somebody say slow. If you want real strict, don't go get a cheeseburger three weeks from today and gobble that thing down. Okay? Just don't. Go slow. And there's all kinds of helps. Click the link on our website. It'll help you with all that stuff. It's not a diet. Um, a juice fast is an option, water fast, or a total fast. A total fast without water, I don't recommend anybody does that more than one day. You can do it. Some people have done it longer. Jesus did it 40 days. Moses did it 40 days. Elijah did it 40 days. So a supernatural 40-day fast with no food or water, certainly people do it. But that's not what we're asking you to do. And most biblical, most biblical examples are really uh, from sun up to mid sun up 6 to 3 6 a.m. to 3 is a typical Jewish fast fast most common in the bible you see 3 day fasts other uh, examples you see maybe a 21 day fast but most examples are not 40 days there's those are supernatural fasts that God did for, for specific things people do it even people in the military in certain branches fast uh, specifically to to build up their endurance so it, it's something that can be done uh, so it's not that we can't do it but I'm just saying if you've never done it take your time Go slow, but make sure you're hungry. If you're not hungry on the fast, you didn't fast. Okay? That's, I just want to say it. So uh, 2 Chronicles 20, you're not going to turn the whole thing. Jehoshaphat calls for a group fast. That's what we're doing. Uh, the Bible says Jehoshaphat feared, so he, see, he, was, he seeked the Lord, and he called for a fast. How many know sometimes we feel fear? Sometimes we feel regret. Sometimes we feel pain. Sometimes we feel loss. But the key is when we feel those emotions is not to let the emotions run wild, but to choose the fast. And that's what Jehoshaphat did. So it, it, we're, we're experiencing an emotion, but we're going to choose to fast. As he fasted, the Lord defeated their enemies 
before them. Second uh, Chronicles 20, it says, Now when they began to sing and praise the Lord, set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had fought against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end to the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. Let me just insert this here. Your prayer and fasting should also include worship. Um, boy, you got that phone, get some iTunes, click on some worship stations if you don't already have them. And, and incorporate that. Have just some personal worship time. Whatever, whatever works for you. But what happens is when we worship, God, what he did here, he'll do for you. Not only will he defeat the enemy that is currently in front of you, he will defeat the other enemies that you're facing, and they'll start to defeat one another. See, when we fast, when we worship, God works on our behalf. If we try to do it on our own, God just sits back. See, what we do is we need to fast and pray Speak the word and God works. Jesus said this, I speak the word and my father does the work. Jesus said that. So speaking the word, praise and adoration, worship. Don't just go hungry for 21 days because you failed in the fast. You just went hungry. Go hungry. And what I do throughout the day, I don't think I said at this service yet, is I, throughout the day as I feel hunger pains because you will. As a matter of fact, we think, well, my stomach's growling. I need to eat. No, your just digestive tract is moving and making noise. That doesn't mean you're hungry. So many, we don't, most of us in our society don't know what it likes to, don't really know what it's like to feel hungry. I've never gone a hungry day in my life unless I chose to fast, not once. And most of us could say that. Some exceptions, I realize that. But most of us here today have never gone hungry without choosing to fast. And so we really don't know what hunger feels like. Say, well, we just eat at 6, we eat at noon, and we eat at 6 again, kind of, or whatever your schedule is. What we're doing is we're starting to learn what hunger really is. And so as you feel that hunger pain, and you'll feel hungry, but they start to dissipate a little bit. When you feel it, I, here's what I do throughout the day. I just say, thank you, Jesus. I'm drawing near to you. And I just kind of turn it into a prayer rather than thinking, man, I wish I could eat. Because, yeah, of course you're thinking you wish you could eat, but why dwell on that? Just so you can feel worse? <laughs> that doesn't help. All right. Total fast, no food and water. Esther fasted three days. As a result, she received favor with the king. She received a divine plan for deliverance for her people. Uh, Paul, the apostle, fasted for three days. Um, the results were he received his call from God. He received his sight back. And then this is uh, the Daniel fast, or no pleasant food fast, which I think, in part, most of us could do what's called a Daniel fast. There's a link on our website. It will help you understand this. Um, but let me just say this. The Daniel fast, which is it's a whole series of websites and a whole movement now, which I think is good. But literally, I tried the Daniel fast. Trish and I tried it a number of years ago. And you literally, if you follow the Daniel fast, there's all kinds of recipes. You can gain weight. So I'm not suggesting that this is about a diet, but why would you want to gain weight on a fast? It just doesn't make much sense to me. Because um, you will lose some weight. It will be part of the residual. That's not our primary purpose. But certainly that will happen. Water weight for sure, and then a few pounds here and there. But but the thing is, and you do what you want. You do what God tells you to do, but I think you could just eat vegetables, no problem. There's an example where Daniel ate vegetables and drank water for 10 days. Maybe double that, eat vegetables and drink water. There's some people, that's all they ever eat. You can survive on that. There is protein in vegetables. Uh, if nothing else, let's read this, uh, Daniel 10. In the year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. And he understood the message and understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three full weeks were fulfilled. And what we can glean from this is just say, no meat. Somebody say, no meat. And no sweets. If that's all you do, I, I think we can go further. I really do. I, I would encourage you to do more. But that's, that, that would be a fast in itself. And, and then take that time and replace that time with God. All right? Turn the TV off, things we've talked about. Yeah. Uh, again, I've already mentioned um, extended fast. Find your fasting zone. Begin, as I already mentioned, to fast. Prepare to end it properly. Isaiah 58, which I think is the best scripture in the Bible on the kind of fast God doesn't choose for us and the kind of fast that pleases him. So Isaiah 58, we're not going to read the whole thing today uh, for time's sake, but I encourage you. I reference 
Isaiah 58. Every time I'm fasting, I turn to it because there's just great stuff in there that God talks about. He says, again, we're not fasting to twist God's arm, not to make our names heard on high. Uh, we're humbling ourselves. It's to break the yoke of bondage, to break burdens, oppression, uh, to stop the finger pointing. So many times you say, well, if this just changed in my life or if this was different, oh, just shut up, just fast. Stop blaming everybody else. Just fast and pray. Humble yourself before God. It's to share your bread with a hungry and a poor. Start uh, Every year we say, God, show us what you want us to do to reach out to other people personally. Um, we're already planning on some things as a church, an outreach we'll tell you more about here in the spring that we want to do, something like we've never done before. We're, we are planning uh, our first church-sponsored uh, mission trip in September. Ashley, are you in this service or not? Ashley, you're back there. Ashley, we'll tell you more about it next week. We've got video and stuff. There's an a, a orphanage in Haiti we're partnering with. That she's been there a few times, and she was telling me and Trish about it, and she had such a vision for it. I said, you need to run with it. She said, okay, what do I do? I said, put a plan together, and let's get a trip. And so we're going to do that. And so there's different ways. We're, but, but pray about how, what does God want to do in my life? Um, how does God want me to use me in the church, in ministry, in my giving, what, whatever, whatever that means to you, helping, helping feed the poor and the hungry. Um. And then God will hear our voice and he'll satisfy us with his presence. Verse 11 in Isaiah 58 says, The Lord will guide you continually, satisfy your soul in drought, and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Over the past several weeks, God has been speaking very loud and clear to us, really a number of things, but one thing we've seen specifically is about being uh, rivers of water as a congregation, uh, being a spring, not becoming stagnant, but staying youthful so that the rivers of God can flow through us. And so God is really speaking something, I think, as we close 2018 or have closed 2018 and now step into 2019, that he says this in verse 12, from those among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. We need to be concerned with the next generation. So if I'm serving my generation, whatever age group that is, am I looking to the generation that's 10? years or below, and how can I impact their lives? If you're in your 20s, you should be saying, how can I impact a 10-year-old? If you're in your 50s, you should say, how can I impact a 40-year-old or a 30-year-old or a 20-year-old? Okay. Someone who's 10 years or younger. Uh, now, there's, you, can, you can impact your peers. You can, we can impact everybody around us. How many know that? But what am I doing where someone can take over for me? Someone can learn from my mistakes, from things I've acquired, the wisdom I've applied, Sometimes we miss it, but sometimes we get it, right? Help somebody else so they don't have to go through that pain, right? Mom, make their, uh, their floor our ceiling. But raise up the foundation of many generations. It says you'll be the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. I think God has really, really spoken to us over the, the uh, last part of this year in particular. And I've got something I want to I share with you. Uh, that God spoke to us. I shared this a little bit on Wednesday. If you were here, you heard part of this. And I want to share it with the congregation, something that God spoke to us that I think applies to us as a congregation, but I think it also applies to us individually uh, that God wants us to know what 2019 is going to be. And I, I do believe that 2019 is a year of blessing and abundance. If you've known me for any time, you know I'm not a, a, a numbers guy. Like I'm well, a, a, a numerology guy. Okay, I'm not, I don't say, well, this number says this and this number means that. And there are, uh, there's numerology truth in the Bible. I'm just not into it. I've never really, I, I've looked at it. I've studied it. I think it's true. I just, I'm not, I'm not like, and I don't think living your life like that only is wise, but you need scriptures to support it. And I do think God speaks to us in a lot of different ways. And one of those ways is repetition. And uh, probably the last six months of 2018, my wife, Trish, I'm just going to have the worship team come right back up here. And so uh, if you can come up, uh, worship team. Um, my wife, Trish, kept seeing this number 11. She'd see number 11. She'd go make a purchase, and it would cost $13.11. And she'd look at, oh, she says 311. She'd look at a clock. And I'd say, you're just looking at it when it's, th you're waiting at 310 for a minute, just so I can think you're holier than I am. <laughs> say, do you talk to your wife that way? Absolutely. Just having fun with her. But I did. I said, I don't know. I said, I don't know what's 211. I said, I don't know what that means. And she, kept, she saw it so much, it, I could not ignore it. I said, God, what does this mean? Why is she seeing 11 all the time? And so I started to really just do a search of what the number 11 in the Bible means. And it does mean some significant things. And I believe the Lord was saying, I want you to speak this into your personal life. 
In fact, I mentioned this already. One of the traditions we have in our, in our family is we I'll write the, the, all of our children and our grandson now a scripture for Christmas, and there's cards that we put on the Christmas tree, and then they take that card and they read that's part of, it's really the big, biggest part of what they get from us. Everything else is pajamas and socks, you know, yeah. stuff like that. But uh, not that you don't need them, but you never buy them for yourself, and so mom and dad still get to do that. So, but a word that's in there, and so God spoke to us through that, but I do believe God said for a congregation and for individuals who hear this, I think it's going to be significant, something God wants to bring into our lives in 2019. Deuteronomy 11, 11, it says this. But the land you are crossing the Jordan to take possessions of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from heaven. And I believe the Lord led me to this scripture, and he said, this year of 2019 is going to be a year of increase, a year of abundance, where you are drinking rain from heaven. You say, what does that look like, Pastor? I think it's going to look like a lot of different things. I, I mean, here we stand, and if you've come here any number of years, or, or certainly in the past year, you know that this building was for sale. We couldn't really didn't, couldn't afford to buy what the owners wanted to buy it for, and so they listed it. Uh, they had a contract on it. It was supposed to close on December 30th. It hasn't closed yet, let I just say that. As far as we know, we're still writing rent checks to the same people that own it, and they've been gracious to us. Uh, Faith Reform Church owns the building and some things they needed to do, and so we, 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 we just love them, and they've been great to us. But nonetheless, it still hasn't sold, and so we... They were kind enough to write in a year minimum. We, we're in here at least a year after closing. That's what it says. But it hasn't closed yet, so we really don't know what's going on. I know they'd have to change the land use and all that kind of things if you know anything about that. And it's not going to be real easy, I don't believe. But nonetheless, we're here for no less than a year. So we're not out in the streets. It amazes me. I run into people. I don't know how many people I run into. And they say, well, I hear the church is, is going gonna, is gonna to be moving. And I'm like, well, we haven't seen you in five years. Where did you hear that from? I guess, the, I guess the gossip chain's alive and well in Traverse City. We're not going anywhere. We have several plans. You will not be without, will not be without a building, okay? We won't. We have a couple things we could do, even on a moment's notice if we had to, but that's not going to happen because God's faithful. Come on, somebody. He's faithful. We're just to say, well, pastor, shouldn't we have a plan to buy the building? Well, our plan to buy the building wasn't enough, and so, so I guess not. Say, well, pastors, but this church is doing that, and this church is doing that, and this church had planted seven years ago. They got this many people. Good. Praise the Lord. But here's what we do. We compare our lives with other people. We do this personally, too. And because we compare our lives with others, we miss the favor that God is bringing into our lives because we think our favor should look like somebody else's favor. Don't underestimate the value of your life. The value of one person's life is something that cannot be underestimated. So many times we think, well, God's going to use me in a big way, so it needs to look like this and it needs to look like that. And people even tell you, do this, do this, that. And sometimes you do this, this, and that, and you don't seem to get the same results somebody else did. May I suggest that sometimes God has you or us in a place where we can impact somebody in the next generation that's going to impact people in a greater way than we ever could. And because we stay put, we were able to speak into that person's life. Why can't we look at things that way? You look throughout the Bible and there's all kinds of, in our view, insignificant people that God used to speak to generation after generation after generation after generation. And it was all through a blessing of generations. But here's the thing, you can't cast off your hope. And so when I got this word for 2019 and this number 11, we started to ponder this and think about what God was saying. And if you know a little bit about the history of this church, um, it's, had, it's had quite a weird history, a long history. Trish and I were the original worship leaders 20-some years ago. Gosh, like 23 years ago, I guess. But the church built a building that was way too big and drowning in debt. And can I just say that? We're not afraid of that, but we're not going to borrow money that cripples us. Say, well, pastor, where are we going to meet? Okay, we'll meet in my house and have 500 services on the week. I don't care. But that's, we're not going to, that isn't going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Do you understand that? But see, we think, well, when God does it, how do you, what do you, since when did you figure God out?
But anyway, the history of this church, and so they had more debt than they could handle. Trish and I ended up helping a couple other churches, and somehow, miraculously, really God brought us back up here to the place that we felt we were called. The only place God's ever really called us into ministry just a number of years after we got saved. We felt Traverse City was where God it was on our heart. We moved our whole family here. Then we had to leave, and we served faithfully. But through a series of events, someone came to us and said, hey, the church in Traverse City needs a lead pastor. Would you like to do it? And I'm like, what? Happy leading worship in a pretty good-sized church, changing the culture in their city. If you know where Nuevo is, part of a church there in Nuevo that was running close to 2,000 people, if you can imagine that. It was awesome. I'm like, I like leading worship here. It was just fine for me, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't God's best. It was what God had for that season. Somebody say season. And so God brought us back up here. For a number of years, we were a video campus where we still led worship. But now we've met so many great, talented people that we're just part of the worship team. And we get to do some other things and let all of you do some other stuff on top of that. But we've been up here. We realized last year, 2018, was our 11th year back in Traverse City. I had never consciously thought about it. 11th year. Several years as a video campus. Eight years that I've been, we've been the lead pastor. Seven years in this building and God's done some great things but here we are we don't we don't own a building but what if God was just doing something in a in a, a group of people that was way beyond a building what if God was really building relationships where we could believe God together in the midst of challenges and sacrifice in something that doesn't even look like what we think God is in our culture and God's going to do something that's going to be beyond what we can imagine it's got to start somewhere it might as well start with us I say, it's so weird. People say, well, pastor, it's just because of that sin and this and that. Listen, if God just stopped ministries because of sin in the camp, everywhere you turn, there'd be no ministry. We see people getting saved and giving their hearts to the Lord, getting baptized in the Holy Spirit and serving God all over the place every year. I mean, we've seen in this building more than 350 people that we know of get baptized uh, in water and in the Holy Spirit. And many of them are still here serving. Others are serving other places, and that's great. But 11 years, and I started to say, what does that mean? And, and I found, started to find out in the Bible, the number 11 most commonly means a year, a number of transition. And so often said, and you may have heard this, that the 11th hour comes right before the start of a new day. The 11th hour is right before something brand new is about to break forth. We've had several words over the past eight or ten weeks talking about us crossing over the Jordan. Uh, God gave us a word, among many others, about uh, Jacob and some different things and rain and water and springs and refreshing and newness and all these things have been happening. If you've been here for these services, you've heard some of this over the past eight or ten weeks. So God's promise in Deuteronomy 11 that we just read, He has promised to take them into the promised land. And they've waited 40 years for this, and now God is bringing them in. And normally, as I said, the number refers to a transition. It also is associated with revelation that will help transition us into something new and overdue. Say new, say overdue. You're going to hear me say that quite a bit this year, at least in the next five, six months for sure. God is doing something this year that's new and overdue, both in you personally and in us as a congregation, I believe that with all my heart. There's something that you believe God for a long time, and God has worked patience in your life. You're dedicated. You say, well, God, I've seen this person get blessed this way, and that person get blessed. Stay with me. I know I'm going a little long, but you're going to appreciate this. And I've seen this person get that. Stop looking at those people. God has a plan for you that is not what he has for them. And he's going to do something in your life that is unique for you. And he's had to shape and mold you to get to the place where you are right now so that other people can be blessed through your trial, through your hardship. But see, we don't want to hear that. But that's what God has done throughout creation. He takes someone in their pain and their misery and says, okay, now I've shaped you. Now you can bless others with my message of hope. What if God is doing that? And I believe he is. Some, say something new. Say something overdue. But God is calling us to possess. Number 11, Jacob, which I've already mentioned. He returns to a land of his inheritance with his 11 sons. Maybe you know the story. He steals Esau's birthright. He moves and works for Laban a number of years. He comes back with his 11 sons. Somebody say 11. Who was the 11th son of Jacob? A man named Joseph. 
He was called a dreamer. God used Joseph in a phenomenal way through his revelation, his dreams, his visions to transition Israel into a place of abundance. And I believe that what God is doing in Traverse City Resurrection Life Church in this year of 2019 is that God is raising up dreamers, revelation people, people who have visions, people who are ready to help take the kingdom of heaven into a new transition, something that's new, something that's overdue, and living a life way beyond what we could possibly imagine and so what I want to do this morning is we've prepared communion I'm gonna have the ushers hands out as we're singing one final song I heard this song I said to Tony I said we got to learn this this is gonna be kind of a theme song this year I don't know how else to put it you'll hear it periodically but the words of this song are so appropriate. And again, I, even up till a couple of weeks ago, I had no idea I was going to talk about the number 11. I had no idea, but God started to breathe into this thing. I said, there's something God wants to say for us that's new and overdue. So you personally, as we share communion together, we're going to sing another song. I want you to sing with us. You may not know the words. There's four verses. It's, uh, it's not one we've ever done in this church before. But if nothing else, sing the chorus with us. But look at the words on the screens because I believe it applies to something in your life that's new and overdue that God wants to breathe life into. So let's lift that up to him together. Let's receive communion together today as we kick off this fast together. Would you like to do that? All right. Here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put this little ear thingy on. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.